welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd and for our final Lifestyle Gardening show we're going to focus on pollinators, laying out your landscape before you plant, and new ornamental varieties for 2019. But first we're going to hear from Nebraska Extension Pesticide Application Specialist Greg Kruger about an important problem we're hearing about all the time. Pesticide drift damage has been in the headlines recently, especially from an agricultural standpoint. But as Greg is going to tell us, careful applications of chemical pesticides is just as important for a home gardener. Every pesticide application has a couple things in common. Uh, one, uh, you're using a pesticide to control pest. Uh, that pesticide has a potential to affect the environment around you in ways that you don't intend. So it's always important to first off read and understand the label so that you understand what those potential risks might be. Uh, and then the other thing is that uh, that pesticide offers an opportunity to control a, a pest that may be unwanted in an area, whether that be weeds, insects, or diseases. And so uh, we want to do everything we can to maximize the performance of that pesticide on that potential pest. So. Uh, when we start to think about how we make those types of pesticide applications, it's real important to understand all of the factors that may be at play. Uh, when we start to talk about those different factors, the first thing that's going to come to mind is the, the weather conditions. And in particular, uh, when we talk about spraying some sort of a pesticide, the wind is the first place we want to start. Uh, we know that the, the higher that wind speed gets, uh, the more it's going to change or alter that pattern. Uh, it's going, the more off target movement we're going to get or the pesticides are going to blow away from that intended target area. We also want to consider the potential for rainfall or other types of environmental conditions that could change or alter uh, that pesticide application in some way. So uh, for most of our pesticides that we, we're going to be dealing with, uh, we're talking about products that we need to get uh, in contact with that pest. Uh, if we get a rainfall event uh, shortly after making that application, that could also compromise that uh, pesticide. Beyond that, uh, there's a lot of other things to start to consider uh, uh, that uh, become uh, important in terms of how well that pesticide works. Uh, the first place we always like to start is if you're starting to set up a home sprayer of some sort, uh, think about the nozzles that you want to use. Uh, because the nozzles are going to influence the droplet size, and the droplet size is really going to drive uh, the control that we get. Now, if I'm thinking about that home sprayer, a lot of our applications are going to be made with some sort of a flat fan nozzle. Uh, most of those flat fan nozzles provide a relatively small droplet size, which is going to give us great coverage. But uh, we want to be cautious because if we get too much uh, 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 small droplets being sprayed, uh, we have that potential for uh, drift again, and uh, we could lose that pesticide uh, uh, to areas that uh, that pest may not be, uh, causing unintended effects as well. So as we start to think about those environmental impacts, uh, wind uh, in particular is a very important one, like we mentioned. Uh, in our lab, uh, we've got a set of wind tunnels that we use to uh, mimic uh, certain application conditions, trying to understand how that wind might influence that uh, application. Uh, we've also got a set of greenhouses that allow us to grow and cultivate pests. So uh, unlike a lot of the greenhouses you might see across Nebraska, here we're going to have uh, different uh, uh, weeds growing up in the greenhouse. We might have uh, uh, different diseases or insects that we're cultivating here uh, with the intent of trying to see how uh, different nozzles, different uh, pressures, different uh, uh, application techniques or different pesticide rates might influence that control. So uh, what uh, uh, we're really trying to do is understand uh, how all of those different factors uh, uh, from uh, decisions that we make in setting up that sprayer to the environmental conditions to uh, uh, how that pest might respond to those application techniques influence uh, the control of that pest in the environment. Good gardeners always read and follow those label instructions on pesticide bottles. Keep an eye on the weather, especially when it's windy, rainy, or extremely high temperatures before you head out to the garden with those pesticides. We'll hear more from Greg later in the program when he shows a few examples of how drift can seriously damage those non-target plants. This season's Go Gardening features have been focusing on helping new homeowners come up with a solid landscape plan. Now it's time to take all of that information you've learned and start planting. There's just one more step we'd like to share with you before you plant, and that's taking your plans outside with a tape measure.
In our Go Gardening series, we've walked you through the process of starting with what you know, developing concepts, figuring out where your hardscapes should be, talking about hardscape materials and plant materials. You've done a little bit of that design thinking. You've maybe put some things on paper. Now it's time to actually figure out whether what you think you want will fit where you want it to go. So in the best of all worlds, we would be outside with our tapes and our boots and everything that we need, our marking flags, to be able to lay out and then verify, yes, you want this in this location at this size. But we're going to actually talk a little bit about some of the tools you can use to do that and how you get started. So first off, of course, is to figure out how to measure and measure with what. Most people don't have a measuring wheel. They're really useful and not very expensive. So you can certainly use a measuring wheel. You can use a tape measure. You can use your feet. And one of the best things, especially for those of you who have on a Fitbit or a fitness tracker, is to figure out your pace. And that makes it pretty simple to come pretty close in the landscape to what a dimension is of a patio, for example, or the distance between plant materials. You also can use a garden hose. And a garden hose, obviously, for its flexibility, allows you to actually twist and move those bed lines so that you can see whether you really like the curve, if it's a curve, or whether you like how a curve hits a straight line. Think in terms also as you're laying that out, it might be a tight curve that looks kind of nice on paper, but the reality of you and the lawnmower or your lawn service and the lawnmower is it going to work for you? So that's another tool. So you're laying out on the ground what you actually put down on paper. One of the, one of the mistakes that gets made in the landscape world is we put, we put plant material too close to physical structures. That's so easy to do because, of course, when you go purchase a plant, it might be in a number one, a, a one gallon, it might be a two gallon, it might be a little bit bigger, but we tend mentally to think in terms of, all right, here's the shrub. I'm going to put it right next to the wall of my house. A really good way for you to think about that and not make that mistake, understand the full spread of the plant, which we've talked about. Back yourself up to the wall of your house or any physical surface that is immovable. Take a big giant step and then put the crown of that plant at that point, not the, not the center point of that plant. Then what you can do is lay out those bed lines again using your measuring tool or your hose or your flags to make sure you've given yourself enough room for those plants to grow. Looking at those connections from straight line to curve line, making sure that visually it is not cutting into your vision with you know, an, an abrupt angle or a curve that ends in kind of a strange spot. So it really ends up being one of those pretty simple ways to make that mental connection and visual connection between what you think you've designed and then how you can actually implement that when it finally comes time to use that bed edger to cut the lines, to go ahead and lay those flagstones or those pavers, get that patio poured, choose those plants, lay them out in the right spot and make sure that that landscape then is satisfying to you for what you had in mind to begin with. As a new homeowner, you don't have to settle for what is already there when you move in. Just like getting new furnishings for your living room, bedrooms, and kitchen, your outdoor living space can be an extension of your personal taste and fulfill your practical needs. As part of your plans for your landscape, you're going to need some new plants. For this final landscape lesson, we're going to feature some of the best new plants on the market for you to try. We could spend an entire series talking about new plants for the landscape, but we don't have that kind of time and probably neither do you. I'm gonna start with All America selections and of course we will show you those in the Backyard Farmer Garden. Terry will talk about them on the minute, but let's whet your appetite and tempt you a little bit with one of the ones that will be fabulous. It's not this one because we don't have it yet, but it is called Begonia Viking XL Red on Chocolate. Deeper foliage, deeper red, great for the garden. There's a new marigold with a funky name called Big Duck Orange. 
I happen to be a plant nerd who also really likes the shrubs, the trees, the perennials that really add to the landscape on, on a more long-term basis. And of course, there are lots of new, new plants in, in that part of the house as well. There is a new Baptisia called Decadence Dark Chocolate. We have a couple of the older, older new Baptisias in the garden, so we're looking forward to that one. There are, of course, several Hookeras in the Dolce series. They have fun names like Cat's Pajamas Cat Mint, which is really great. There is a new salvia that is Indigo Girl. So this is the annual salvia, but Indigo Girl is going to be perennial for us. Now remember, you get to go online and look. All those new plants have great pictures, great marketing. Just because it's new doesn't mean it's going to work for you. So look with caution. For example, we have fall cypress. There's one called soft serve that's been available. This is gonna be a winter that probably knocks fall cypress out of pretty much everywhere in Nebraska. Another great one is Temple of Bloom, which is the Seven Sun Shrub selection. We have Seven Suns in the Backyard Farmer Garden, so we're looking forward maybe to trying this new one. There's a Wygelia called Sonic Bloom that has great red fall color. So all sorts of new plants. Let us try them first, or at least do a lot of research and see whether or not paying the money for those new plants is going to be worth it for your landscape. Newer, more, and varied colors and textures are really great. Just make sure whatever you select is part of your overall landscape garden plan and that it has a decent chance of growing wherever you place it. Another great resource for you if you're interested in plant materials comes to you every week on Backyard Farmer as the plant of the week, and that starts in April. Another great thing about spring besides the bulbs popping out of the ground is the return of those pollinators. These critically important insects are a really important part of gardening, and we'd have a pretty thin harvest if they didn't do their job. For this week's interview, we talked to extension professional Judy Wu Smart about promoting pollinator habitats. We get so many questions now about pollinators in the gardens and in our landscapes. And it's a very good question, and it's a very positive question, depending on who you ask. So it's my pleasure to have Judy Wu Smart with us today, and Judy is going to be talking to us about pollinators in the landscape. So Judy, what is the overarching question that people ask, or more importantly, what do you recommend for them when they're talking about introducing pollinators to their landscape? I would say think about diversity. Think about promoting biodiversity in your plants um, so you can create a landscape that will encourage and attract multiple species of pollinators from bees to butterflies to flies and beetles. So think about biodiversity and creating a habitat is going to be suitable for lots of different organisms. We know they want a list of plants. Are those the sorts of things that really make a lot of sense for people or are they really better off to think about this as a system or are there a handful of plants that you would recommend? Well, a, a list is great, but you can be overwhelmed by the number of plants that are being um, in those lists. So I would consider thinking about plants that will bloom in the spring, in the summer, and in the fall, and provide nectar and pollen sources for those pollinators throughout the season. And think about your plant list in terms of how can I create diverse plant um, resources. So think about the the color of those plants, the shape of those plants, their growth habits, and that will. Uh, really encourage the most um, diverse population of pollinators that you can into your garden. What do we want to say about using pesticides in the landscape, especially if we're trying to not only attract those pollinators but keep them healthy? Uh, well, I would consider when you're sourcing your plants to try to um, ask the nurseries or the plant sources if they treat their com if they treat their plants for systemic compounds because those can be a little bit more persistent and long lasting in the plants themselves. The other thing I would really strongly encourage is that people think about the the use of their pesticides and that includes herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides. Use them when you need it as a last resort to treat something that you know and have identified and monitored those levels. Um, so. Use them wisely, use them sparingly, and try to find uh, products that are, have lower toxicity to pollinators, and that will um, significantly improve um, both your garden and um, sustain some healthy pollinator communities. 
What do we think about people who want hives in town? Is that a really good idea? Is that more difficult than it sounds? Well, I think that the most common thing is that there's a lot of people who really want to help bees and you don't have to own hives to help bees. It starts with the landscape, but if you've done that and you want to keep going and you are interested in beekeeping, um, the first thing is to take a course, to take a class, to learn about what it takes, not just financially, but time commitment wise, and um, really see if that is a suitable hobby or um, adventure that you want to start. Uh, it does have a lot of upfront costs and it does take some time to manage, um, but it is a very rewarding hobby and it is a very rewarding um, way to connect with nature. Thanks, Judy. I know our audience is really going to appreciate that information and look forward to spring when finally those pollinators can come out of their hibernation for the season. Thank you for having me. It's been great. You might have heard us emphasize many of these concepts before. Diverse landscapes, thoughtful pesticide applications, and pollinator habitats. Concepts that make gardening more rewarding and enjoyable for everyone. It's time now to answer a few of your questions. If you've got a question you'd like to submit to the show, drop us an email at byf at unl.edu. Please tell us as much information as you can, including where you live, and attach those pictures as JPEGs. Our first question comes to us from Loretto, Nebraska. And I must admit, I had to look that up. I've actually never heard of Loretto, Nebraska. Come to find out, it is about northwest of Columbus by quite a little piece, so right in the middle of the state. And his question is a pretty interesting one. We have had a fair number of turf questions in the winter, which means people are really interested in their turf in the spring and the summer. But what he wants to do is convert an area that is old, overgrown, actually unmown uh, bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass, into a mown landscaped area. So he sent us a couple of pictures. One of them is the unmown bluegrass that he wants to convert with a nice little gazebo sitting in it. The other is the, uh, the, the turf that he actually has managed and brought back into some semblance of looking like a lawn simply by continuing to mow and mow and mow. So this is sort of a fun question to answer. It appears as though he has actually reestablished at least a bit of a turf by mowing, maybe correctly or, or incorrectly, but at least he's gotten it mowed. I suspect what our turf specialist would say is, go ahead and mow it down, rake out all that dead stuff, see what you've got, start on a real regime this spring of aerifying. If you haven't done any aeration lately, look at your fertilizer regime figure out which parts of that area that is currently in turf or in unmowed turf that you actually want to convert to landscape beds. And if there are areas where you really don't want the turf at all, come spring it'll be time to either go ahead and do a, a chemical control or go ahead and start tilling that up. You'll have to fight with it for a little bit because of course every little piece of that root of bluegrass that stays in the soil may come back up through your landscape beds. But of course we have a turf chair and our specialists in the turf chair certainly starting uh, with the show in April will give us really good advice for those of you who want to bring, the, bring your lawn out of the winter doldrums and hope you have a little bit of green sprouts this spring. All right, so our, our, our next question comes to us from somewhere, but it doesn't really matter in this case because this is a house plant. This viewer has sent us a picture of an anthurium and many of you might have gotten these beautiful tropical flowers as cut flowers. They're, they're very popular in the cut flower industry. They come not only in red, but they do come in pink and kind of a purpley sort of a color, although it seems like, especially in big red country, it's the red one that we really enjoy the most. The question is, uh, she cannot get this anthurium to bloom. So if you look, what we can see in this one image is, it, it looks like it's, maybe been overwatered. You've got an awful lot of droop in the foliage. Typically with anthurium, you do not want to water too frequently, about once a week, but you also don't want to soak so thoroughly that the, the, the root mass is soggy. So you want to let it dry out in between waterings. These are tropical plants. They actually do best in very bright but indirect sunlight. So away from 
away from a window where they're just going to get blasted by the sun. They, they need a rest period to come back into bloom. And it may be that what has happened is that combination of either overwatering or not watering enough, too much sunlight because that's a pretty bright window and not being patient for the, for the uh, resting period is a part of the issue. So start with the indirect sun, move it into that location, take a, take a peek at how you're really watering the plant. When the foliage becomes glossy again, that will, that will be one indicator that it is in good health. You'll, you'll want to, as we move further into spring, and that's probably, hopefully, four to six weeks from now, go ahead and, and provide a, a, a balanced fertilizer or perhaps one that's a little higher in phosphorus and make sure that that watering is, again, consistent. And typically, anthuriums then will, will go through that kind of a cycle. They'll, they'll bloom for two or three months, then they'll rest, they'll bloom, they'll rest. It doesn't look necessarily like this one needs repotting yet, but when you see it, uh, the roots beginning to push to the surface, that can also be an indicator that it is, is uh, really exhausted its home in that container and it will be time to repot. So a couple of, of uh, hints for you to, to uh, look at with this plant, beginning really with what is your watering regime. As we wrap up today's program, we're going to hear from Greg Kruger again. This time, Greg shows us what pesticide drift can do to your plants. You'll see that careless chemical pesticide application can cause some serious damage, and Greg helps us avoid doing just that. So when we think about uh, off-target movement or unintended effects from that application, the first thing that comes to mind is damage. Uh, when we think about uh, potential damage, uh, it's really going to be specific to the chemistry we're applying. Uh, over the last couple years, we've had lots of focus on dicamba and the growth regulator herbicides in, in uh, more generality. Those particular chemistries are going to cause uh, cupping, uh, crinkling, uh, twisting. Uh, uh, they may cause curling or things like that. So uh, it, when we think about the damage there, that's gonna be quite different than uh, the damage from Roundup. So if I'm out there uh, spraying uh, around the garden, trying to clean up some weeds with some Roundup, uh, the damage I might see there is gonna look very different from that. Uh, we might see uh, necrosis, we might see uh, some, some leaves starting to die, uh, turning brown. Uh, so every chemistry's got a little bit different signature uh, and every chemical group has a little bit different signature in terms of the damage we see. Keep in mind when you're evaluating damage too, uh, damage is a function of the dose or the exposure uh, to that chemistry. So when we look at the different chemicals, uh, uh, some uh, chemicals at very, very small doses will cause a, a visual response where uh, other chemistries, it takes a, a larger dose before we see that uh, damage start to kick in. So uh, uh, with some chemistries, we've gotta be much, much more careful about where and how we're applying those. Uh, around sensitive areas than other chemistries because of the, the potential risk for damage that might occur. The other thing that we want to do is look for every opportunity to manage that pest uh, uh, from ways other than chemical means. So uh, this may mean bringing in uh, things such as tillage, uh, uh, crop rotation, or even uh, uh, mechanical means uh, such as uh, hoeing or uh, uh, manual uh, eradication of weeds or other pests uh, when the opportunity presents itself. Now keep in mind that uh, every pest we're dealing with may be a little bit different so uh, uh, obviously uh, when we talk about hoeing weeds out uh, that's, that same technique is not going to be very effective when we talk about disease control or uh, insect control uh, uh, necessarily. So, uh, But uh, when we talk about uh, putting this together as a system it's really bringing all the tools that we have in the toolbox together and using them all in different uh, orders and rotations to make sure those products last as long as possible. Uh, the things I want to think about uh, in terms of uh, either making an application or being around somebody that might be making an application for next year, uh, first off, uh, read and follow the label. Uh, before uh, uh, we make any pesticide application, it's uh, critical to understand the components of that label. Uh, beyond that, though, we really want to start to think about the environmental conditions in which we're making that application. Uh, again, uh, coming back to that wind speed and wind direction being the, the real critical uh, juncture in terms of how much uh, uh, off-target movement I might get from that application. Uh, the next thing I want to think about is what might be around me. So 
investigating those sensitive areas, understanding uh, the potential risks uh, if I do get uh, off target movement, what might be damaged uh, or what might be uh, uh, impacted uh, from that pesticide application. Uh, the third thing is really thinking about uh, how do I manage that application from uh, a droplet size standpoint and that comes back to the nozzles and, and the products that I'm running through that tank. So looking at how can I make uh, or create as large a droplets as possible to minimize that off-target movement but yet making sure I've got sufficient coverage to get that pesticide to work the way it needs to. Remember that pesticides are one of the options in IPM but it does make sense to use them carefully and follow the labeled instructions. It takes a lot of care and work to grow your vegetable and flower gardens, and it's a shame when they can be damaged by something you can easily control. That's going to do it for this season of Lifestyle Gardening. It's only a few short weeks until the gardening season begins, so be sure to tune in to NET for Backyard Farmers starting in April. We wish you nothing but the best in your gardening efforts and hope we got you off to the right start. So good morning, good gardening, Thanks for watching and we'll see you next winter on Lifestyle Gardening.